Hey, uh, so I want to uh, uh, make one comment about the excellent question I got yesterday, which I didn't, uh, uh, overnight I decided I understood the question. So if you have uh, uh, some controls, and I said, uh, if the uh, operator algebra, you know, just keeps growing and growing and growing, getting more uh, new and new terms, uh, then you have control. And that's true, but you, you have control. Do you have, con the question was, do you have control over all of Hilbert space or just some of it? And I realized that if there's some symmetry operator, let's say, for example, photon number parity that acts non-trivially on the Hilbert space, I know that's not the identity operator or something, uh, and if it commutes with all the controls you chose, you could never change the parity. So then you can only get half the Hilbert space. So that's, there is some fine print in the theorem. <laughs> uh, so, um, so now I'm, I'm not any closer to being a mathematician, but I'm slightly less wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you've got a sum. I don't know how to prove that you there are no such symmetries, and therefore you. Uh, but yeah, so I don't know the answer to that. Okay, all right. Now let's talk about something I do know about. Ah, uh, so gonna I'm gonna talk in the last lecture about um, sort of my take on quantum error correction. And you've had uh, earlier uh, talks from uh, Victor Albert and Liang Zhang, and maybe there was a third one, I've forgotten. Uh, uh, and so some of this uh, you'll have seen before, but um, you know, as some one of the other lecturers said, repetition is a good thing. And uh, I'm gonna show you also some experimental details. Okay, so, and our theme is uh, uh, you shouldn't try to do quantum error correction with qubits. You should use bosonic modes. Although, as I told you, to control bosonic modes, you need some qubits or some other anharmonic objects. So you can never quite get away from them. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so the fundamental law of uh, quantum information science and technology is no matter how well you do building better uh, qubits, there's just no such thing as too much coherence. You know, if you make the coherence a hundred times better, uh, you know, Zlatko will come and say, yes, but I want to run an even longer program. Uh, so it's just, um, you're gonna need quantum error correction. Okay. So, uh, so in I, I try, you know, I knew what I was going to talk about. I just wasn't sure how to beat it into the theme of the school. So uh, 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 here I'm going to say what we're doing is modifying non-equilibrium quantum dynamics with a Maxwell demon uh, in order to keep qubits alive. That's that's why it's connected to the theme of the school. Okay. So as you learned in, in the previous lectures, uh, a logical qubit, let's say, may, is made out of n physical qubits. And uh, there's some kind of Maxwell demon. It's either an autonomous error correction circuit or one that makes measurements and then sends the signals up to your classical computer and you make decisions about what to do about it and you make corrections. And effectively, what you're doing is pumping entropy out of the collection of qubits into a cold bath, effectively, and uh, removing errors in the state by making tricky measurements that tell you about the errors, but not the logical state in which the error occurred. You cannot learn anything about that, or you've collapsed the logical state. Okay. So, uh, so the take home message is that everything's better with bosons. Uh, and I'm gonna try to show you that that's true, at least in the current state of the art for experiments, could change. 
So, uh, so uh, qubits are called discrete variable uh, quantum systems. Oscillators are called continuous variable, but you could store the same quantum information in one or the other. So if you had three two-level systems, there are eight states that you can label by the binary, some binary numbers representing the, the measurement values of Z in the, the standard computational basis. And there are just eight amplitudes that you need to know. Uh, you could encode the same information in the first eight levels, zero through seven, of a harmonic oscillator. Uh, and uh, this uh, excitation number uh, is uh, mapped to the corresponding binary number in the discrete case. And um, it's a little tricky to think about what does it mean that an oscillator is a continuous variable system? It has an infinite number of states, but it's not that infinite. It's countably infinite. Uh, it's not, there's not as many states as there are. There's as many states as integers, but not as many as real numbers. Uh, and yet there's a continuous psi of X you can talk about, or psi of P, uh, uh, which, you know, looks like, it might be as complicated as the reals, but they have to be a certain level of smoothness if the energy is uh, finite. But this is not unlike, even if you have a qubit, you can have amplitudes that are, you know, a linear composition of zero and one, you can make. You know, Continue, you can vary continuously. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, but you can, that's right, but you can measure uh, the, a continuous object, the position in an oscillator. I don't think, yeah, so uh, it, it's just a statement that the Hilbert space is infinitely like big. Well, yeah, no, that's exactly right. You could you could measure x precisely, but the energy would then be of that state would be spread over infinite amount. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so the quantum error correction problem. So you all have heard about this. I'm just going to tell you my version of the story. Uh, I'm going to give you an unknown quantum state. If you were to measure it, there's going to be some collapse, and it's going to change. Uh, and so if you go to look for errors, it's gonna change. Uh, and your task is if it develops an error, please fix it. Well, how in the world could you possibly, it seems impossible. But in fact, it can be done. And personally, I think the fact that it can be done is much more amazing than the amazing fact of you could build a quantum computer with perfect hardware and do quantum computation. The fact that you can do it with imperfect hardware seems much, much more amazing than the fact of quantum computing itself. Uh, so uh, there's a no-go theorem for error correction in classical analog computers, right? Analog computers have uh, voltages that are continuous or the position of a gear that has a continuous angle. And so all real numbers, you know, are, are perfectly valid computational states. There's no way to tell if there's an error and uh, you can't fix them, roughly speaking. Quantum machines have both analog and digital features. As Leo was just saying, when you have qubits, you can have continuously, you know, you need real numbers to specify the superposition of zero and one. You need two real numbers. And, uh, uh, so, uh, and yet they have digital features. When you measure a qubit in the Z basis, you always get zero or uh, plus one or minus one or zero or one, right? So it's both analog and digital. So the, what are the rules of the quantum error correction game? It's very interesting. There's a, you, it, think of it as an adversarial game. It's you versus the noise demon. And the noise demon has more power than you do. The noise demon can continuously rotate the qubits. It can do non-Clifford gates. 
it has universal computational power to make gates that is add noise to the state that uh, you don't have, let's say. Uh, now we're gonna put some constraints on the noise demon that you know the the noise is 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 um, low weight and uh, hopefully geographically local and hopefully the noise demon has bounded speed but it still has universal computational power and let's say you don't you have let's say. Uh, only Clifford gates and measurements, which are not universal. And you can still win the game. That's amazing. Okay, you have to be faster than the demon and you can't make too many mistakes yourself when you do these uh, Clifford operations and measurements, but you can, you can beat the demon. How can that be? Well, uh, it's because, uh, when when the demon you know makes some t gate or some arbitrary rotation when you make a measurement you collapse it's this discreteness of the measurement results you get rid of some of the analog nature of the system so in particular you could be in a state with a superposition of no error and a, a small amplitude for an error and map that information onto an auxiliary qubit and when you measure it, you either get zero or one. There was no error or there was a complete error. Okay, so, uh, so to, to make a logical qubit, you have to hide the logical information in non-local, non-classical correlations over multiple physical qubits. Why is that? Because, um, no single physical qubit is allowed to know this logical state, because if it did, then uh, the environment could, um, you know, uh, measure this state or the qubit could fluoresce. Anyway, the environment would learn the state of that qubit. If it, as a result of that, learns the logical information, it's all over. Okay, so you have to hide the information in non-local correlations. And then how do you tell there are errors? Well, there have to be special multi-qubit measurements that you can make that are kind of unnatural, like they're, they're high weight, you know, uh, pally strings of maybe four operators or something uh, that don't look a lot like what the errors look like. Uh, you have to be able to make such measurements uh, in the and given the way you've encoded the inter information, those measurements will tell you about what errors happened without telling you what the log what state the error happened in, what the logical information is. And uh, so the it all works because quantum errors are analog, they're continuous. But measured errors are discrete. They're either there or they're not there. Okay. So it's state. This is the one instance in all of quantum mechanics when state collapses your friend. Okay. All right. So uh, so so uh, here is our our setup, and uh, we see right away a huge problem. If your logical qubit is made of n physical qubits, the error rate has gone up by a factor of n, right? Because they're all having errors. So you, every quantum error correction system starts by in making a code which makes the error rate much worse. It's a huge step backwards, okay? And the Maxwell demon has to be so good and so fast that it can overcome that factor of n just to reach break even, to get back to the place that you were if you had just taken the best, single best of these physical qubits and encoded your information in that guy. So that's a big challenge. And, uh, and, 
the you know there's a big literature on uh, quantum error correction, and very few of the papers advertise uh, whether they got better than the best single quantum object in in your logical system. Okay, so we call this error correction gain, and the definition of gain equals one is not that turning on the Maxwell demon made the error rate lower. It has to make it lower than the best single, not this, to, this best single guy. You have to overcome the factor of n. Okay, so you can, uh, what is the definition of better? Well, it's sort of uh, the average channel fidelity. You, roughly speaking, prepare your all of possible logical qubit states and see how, if you're just doing a quantum memory, you wait a while, you do your error correction, you measure the state, and you see whether it's uh, still the same. And you know maybe if you prepare logical Z, uh, it can change because of logical bit flips, and that occurs at some rate, and you prepare logical X, it might dephase at a different rate, and so you have to average over all places on the block sphere, or at least the cardinal points, uh, to figure out uh, what you'll call the average, uh, average fidelity. And it will typically fall exponentially, and you can um, uh, determine the rate. What? Uh, uh, that just means. Um, on some, on, um, on, uh, yeah, that's a channel. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, there are different channels. You can have uh, amplitude damping, uh, dephasing. You can have uh, 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 poly channels. You can have non poly channels, like you fall from. Um, excited state to ground state, but you never jump back. It's, you know, uh, asymmetric in that manner. Uh, and uh, so the error correction gain, uh, we're going to define in terms of um, uh, the, the uh, uh, rate of decay of the information on average in your logical qubit compared to the uh, minimum over all possible uncorrectable encodings using the hardware that you used to make up your logical qubit. So in the short code example with nine physical qubits, one of those is better than all the others. That's the guy you have to beat with your logical uh, encoding, okay? And so when you overcome that factor of n, that's break even, and n is defined as error correction gain of one. Yeah. That's the, that's the rate of decay of the fidelity of the logical error corrected qubit. Uh, so, um, so uh, it, well, it's it's basically this thing for for your uh, channel that includes the noise channel and the correction error correction channel on top of it. So just think of this as the uh, uh, rate of decay of the fidelity of your logical qubit. You prepare it in some state. You, the, you apply error correction for some length of time, then you see if you're still in the same state. And it falls off at rate e to the minus gamma L over uh, 2T, I guess. Yeah, so if I make my, I make my logical qubit, it's got, you know, nine physical qubits, okay? What's the best uncorrectable code I can get out of that? Well, it's probably 
the best behaving single physical qubit with the longest coherence time. And so I could store my information in that and see how it decays. That's the thing I have to beat. That's this, okay? What's this? This is, I take my logical qubit, I prepare it, you know, in some, some I don't know, uh, some, some logical state, I, which is, uh, you know, some complicated entangled state of these nine guys. And then I run my error correction circuit, run it, run it, the noise is acting. I stop at some length of time and I see, am I still in the same state? What's the fidelity? And it falls off at some rate gamma L. If that rate is equal to the best of whatever uncorrectable encoding, like maybe the best single physical qubit, then I've reached break even. If I use this logical code, but don't turn on the error correction, then this rate will be nine times bigger than that because there are nine physical qubits, at least nine because some of these may be worse than the best guy. But if I turn on the error correction and it gets about nine times better, I will finally reach break even. If it gets 900 times better, then the error correction gain is 100. Now, uh, if I reach break even, I've now done all this horrible work and I got a logical qubit that was the same as just using one of those guys. Well, I don't want to be at error gain one. I want to be at gain 10 to the 15. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you have to be, uh, this is only the error correction gain for memory. Suppose that I, as a result of building my code, I make the logical lifetime 100 times longer. But now it's so complicated that when I do a single or two logical qubit gate, it's 100 times slower because it's just harder. Then I've got error correction gain for memory, but not for computation. Does that make sense? So, yeah. I, yeah, I want G to be 10 to the 15. And I'm going to show you the first experiments that finally got above one. But they're still somewhat lower than 10 to the 15. <laughs> Does that help? Um, so, um, uh, okay, good. So in superconducting, you know, it depends on the technology. In superconducting qubits, um, for heroic uh, hero devices, uh, the coherence times can be uh, now uh, around a millisecond, uh, which is a million times larger than it was in uh, 20 years, 25 years ago when we started. That's pretty good progress. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, in ions, uh, can be longer, but the gates are slower. You know, everybody has uh, pluses and minuses. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it has to be spread out. So suppose there's an error. Well, what would an error be? Roughly speaking, an error is that the environment measured that guy and found out what state it was in, say. It made an X measurement or a Z measurement or something. Uh, so if the environment learns the state of this guy, it had better not learn the state of the logical qubit. So 
you have to hide the information by putting it into non-classical correlations among all the parts. Yeah, exactly. Good. Thank you for that question. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, I don't think I'll spend uh, uh, time on this, but stable, you know, you have n qubits. So you have two to the n states. That's way too many to make a logical qubit. You only want two states. So, um, so I want uh, some pick out of the large Hilbert space, a zero logical and a one logical. And I want to not have the others. So the way you do that is impose n minus one constraints uh, by finding stabilizer operators and insisting that every uh, state in the code space is a plus one eigenstate of those operators. And they have to be mutually commuting, uh, you know, in order for that to, to make sense. And they have to commute with the logical operators. Uh, and then that constrains the size of your logical Hilbert space to two. Is that clear? So I have n things and n minus one constraints that leaves one qubit degree of freedom left. Okay. And do we want them to commute with each other and with the logical operators so that you can measure these things to look for errors? And they'll be useful in telling you about errors if at least some of them anti-commute with all the physical errors that can happen so that they change sign. And then you can say, aha, there's an error, okay? But because they commute with the logical operators, when you measure them, it doesn't cause a logical bit flip or phase flip or error, okay? That's the idea. Yes, so so they they commute with logical operations, but anti at least some of them anti commute with each of the possible physical errors that I want to detect. Yeah, right. So some error local errors will change three different stabilizers. You know, some they all change at least one. Okay. All right, so you know the Shore code is a uh, you know typical example, and Peter Shore, I mean, uh, you know, besides inventing these amazing algorithms, also invented error correction. Um, uh, how many errors are there? Well, you could have uh, 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 you know on a given qubit, you can have identity which is not an error, or you could have, let's say, X, Y, or Z uh, Pauli errors. And uh, so there are three kinds of errors and nine possible locations where the error could happen. This code will correct one error. How many ways are there to have one error? Well, there's three times nine, 27 different single error states plus the no error state. So there are 28 things we have to resolve by measuring our stabilizers. And the stabilizers, uh, well, these are not too hard to measure. These are real hard to measure. They're weight six Pauli operators. And you have to, it's very, it's very unnatural. And you have to do a circuit with six C knots to, to measure this thing. And, um, you know, it's very, very important. You don't measure Z1 and measure Z2 and multiply the results because now you've got two bits of information and that actually will collapse the logical state of the qubit. You have to measure this product, this parity. It's, it's unnatural and tricky to do, okay? These are physical qubits, one through nine, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so these guys detect uh, bit flip errors and these guys detect phase flip errors. So it's basically a repetition code for uh, bit flips, and then you make three copies of it. 
and you arrange these into a repetition code for phase errors. Okay, so uh, I'm mostly here to talk about bosons. I just want to emphasize this is really hard to do, and nobody has ever done this with qubits, in, at least in the short code. Okay, all right, so, uh, so quantum error correction with qubits is very hard because there's so many different error states and you've got to diagnose where they are by making very precise stabilizer measurements very quickly. The code only corrects one error. If a second error happens while you're in the middle of this, you're done for, okay? So uh, instead of using uh, physical objects uh, as our qubits to hold the information, we're going to give that up and use just an empty box holding microwave photon states, make a bosonic code. And uh, here's a bunch of uh, papers. And there are three experiments now, all of them using bosonic codes, which have reached or slightly exceeded the break-even point. And uh, qubits are getting closer to doing this, but they're not quite there yet. Okay, so um, there's this kind of hardware efficiency. This empty box, even if I pick out only one mode of that box, it still has a very large Hilbert space. It could, in principle, replace a number of physical qubits. Uh, so you get a big Hilbert space without adding more moving parts, more places where the errors can occur. It's still just one mode, and it's only in that mode where the errors happen, not nine different uh, objects. And, and a nice thing is that the error model is actually uh, pretty simple. First off, the, the, the cavities have a longer lifetime than the best qubits. And the error model is very simple. You, it's amplitude damping. If you have five photons, you may five, fall to four. Uh, there's not much dephasing. These, these resonators are made in the machine shop. They're bulk, bulk objects. They're near absolute zero. Their dimensions don't fluctuate. So the frequency is extremely uh, well-defined. The only reason they have phase errors is because you unfortunately have to connect a transmon qubit to them to control them. And the transmon could change its state and the dispersive coupling can shift the frequency. But the object itself doesn't intrinsically have dephasing. So basically there are not three N errors. There's just one kind of error, which is photon loss. Okay. So we have this big Hilbert space and we got to figure out how to define two logical states that are different orthogonal superpositions of small numbers of photons. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, so, well, first let's start with the simplest uncorrectable encoding. Uh, well, when you have amplitude damping, you wanna have as a few photons as possible. So let's just pick out uh, a code where logical zero is just zero photons and logical one is one photon. Well, that's not, that can't correct any errors because if I lose a photon, then I've gone, whatever the superposition was before, now I'm in vacuum. So I can't, I've lost the logical information. So this is the analog of that single best physical qubit. It's the best, uncorrectable encoding. And this is the thing I have to beat if I do error correction, okay? So that's how I define break even for a bosonic code if the dominant error is amplitude damping. If it were some other error, maybe it wouldn't be the lowest level, but for amplitude damping it is. Why? Because the rate at which you lose energy or photons is proportional to the photon number. So you want it as small as possible. Okay, so let's, let's meet the sample. This uh, machined thingy here with a, a quarter wavelength transmission line, essentially a, a stub resonator 
uh, is where the microwave photons are going to live. There's a drive port, so you can you can uh, put a classical drive on this uh, harmonic oscillator. There is a transmon uh, qubit, which is our auxiliary helper to give us uh, quantum control of this guy, and it's dispersively coupled to the oscillator. And then, uh, and you can drive the qubit to help give control. And also, there's a uh, a little readout resonator, a little strip line resonator that you can map information from the cavity to the transmon and read out the transmon in order to measure the state of the cavity. So the transmon does double duty as a controller and as a readout device. And uh, so uh, here is our the the T1 for the this resonator is uh, 0.6 milliseconds. Resonators exist up to one second uh, coherence times. They're hard to couple to, but uh, anyway, you can get millisecond scales. And you saw uh, um, uh, Serge Rosenblum's uh, 35 millisecond cavity, I think somebody mentioned in an earlier talk. Uh, where they were, oh, and I, I mentioned, uh, uh, made a 1,024 photon cat, okay? So uh, you can do much better than this. But in this experiment, it's this number. Uh, and uh, uh, here's the uh, base coherence time. Here's the frequency. And um, here's the, the transmon controller, uh, 280 microseconds. The T2 echo time, the phase coherence time is 240. It's at a rather different frequency than the resonator, so they're strongly detuned, and you, you get only dispersive coupling, not direct interaction. And um, so what's the Hamiltonian? Well, uh, I showed you the, uh, the dispersive coupling. We've talked about that several times. Uh, there are some small things I didn't tell you about. so. The, this guy is anharmonic. When it hybridizes with the resonator, the resonator picks up a tiny anharmonicity, you know, tens, 10 hertz to kilohertz. Uh, and there's even a tiny, what we call chi prime, uh, which is that this anharmonicity that the resonator picks up even depends on the state of the transmon, whether it's in ground or excited. So these are uh, problematic uh, for uh, uh, what we're working on, but they're very small. But they they can uh, they can become a problem if your photon number gets large. Yeah. So before you said for these uh, realization, the amplitude, number of photon decay is the name. Yeah. So is that T one in this? Yeah. Right. The, the, the fact that T2 is longer is that well, is so the theoretical limit on T2 is 2T1 if there's no intrinsic dephasing. Uh, this is not quite that, and it's actually related to uh, bad effects happening from the transmon itself. The fact that T1 is, is, is short, shorter than T2. It usually is. That's a synonymous to saying that photon decay is what is the main. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. yes, 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 yes. Uh, that's right. Okay. So, uh, so this this remember is a is a the cosine potential in the transmon makes it anharmonic. And then when you hybridize these guys together through the dipole coupling, the dressed modes, uh, the, the cavity mode has a little bit of participation by this guy, which makes it anharmonic. Uh, so uh, this anharmonicity is 4.8 hertz. Doesn't sound very big, but if you do a control operation where you put a thousand photons in there, then it's big because a thousand squared is a million. <laughs> uh, and this chi prime is 5.8 Hertz. The, you know, uh, 
So, you know, we're getting down we're doing, uh, we're really doing atomic physics here. We're very proud of the fact that we can detect these tiny numbers. Yeah. Uh, so, ah, uh, good. So this is a, instead of making a rectangular box, it just has something trapped inside of it. The problem with making a box is you got to put the lid on it and seal it up. And you have to have a perfect low zero loss super connecting connection across that seam where you put them together. Turns out that's very hard. So what do we do instead? We make a waveguide and we put a coaxial cable inside it. So uh, a coaxial cable, uh, you know, like this, can carry a signal that has a wavelength of, you know, a kilometer, no problem, okay? And that's because it's got a wire down the middle and is a multiply connected geometry. But when you have a waveguide, if you didn't have that center conductor, then it can't carry any signals where the wavelength is bigger than the diameter, roughly. It's a waveguide beyond cutoff. So this guy, combines both. Here's a, a short circuit at the bottom, then a quarter wavelength long piece of transmission line with an open at the top. So it's like an organ pipe that's closed at the bottom and open at the top. It has a lambda over four resonance. And then the rest of this is a waveguide beyond cutoff at this resonance frequency. And so the electric field damps out, damps out, damps out, until you put the lid on it way, way up there where there's no currents flowing. And then you don't have to worry about the seam. Does that help? Yeah. So if you look at the electric field, uh, uh, it's, it's pointing radially. And it's zero at the bottom where it's shorted out and it's a maximum at the top. And then it slowly gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you go up here. So uh, this is a very clever design to get rid of the fact that we can't make super currents flow between two pieces of uh, aluminum very well, even if you put a superconducting indium O-ring between them and all kinds of other things that get tried. Good. Other questions? Okay. Um, uh, okay. So if I start out by using the fact that I have universal control of this two level system through this port, and I make a superposition of uh, ground and excited state for the transmon. And then I have some clever thing I can do through the dispersive coupling to turn that into a superposition of zero and one photons in the resonator. So transfer the, X, the thing from here to here. Well, the lifetime goes up by more than a factor of two because I moved from a low lifetime transmon to a high lifetime cavity. That's not quantum error correction. That's just transferring the information into the single best quantum object in my system. But it's not, it's not an error correctable encoding. I'm just putting it here where it lives longer. Okay? And that's the thing I have to beat that time, uh, not this time. Okay. All right, so uh, there are various codes, which I think you heard about uh, or, or from previous lecturers. The first code to just barely exceed break-even was the Schrodinger cat code experiment done uh, uh, in Rob Sholkoff's lab in 2016. So I showed you Wigner functions of Schrodinger cats, and you can make one uh, where the two coherent states are separated in position. That could be one code word. And another one where they're separated in momentum, that's the other code word. And I can take linear superpositions of them like zero plus one and get that Wigner function, for example. 
okay? And uh, so if you look at the information in the lifetime of the qubit, it was a bad qubit, 15 microseconds in those days. Uh, if you put it into uh, the cavity, it's um, uh, 130 microseconds, only because the cavity lives longer. And then when you turn on the error correction, uh, it just basically was about the same as, uh, as uh, this in, in, in this other uh, experiment, okay? The choice of one logical, why, why, I would have thought maybe alpha plus or minus alpha or alpha minus alpha. Oh, okay, good. Ah, excellent. So both of these are even cats. They have even photon number parity. And so remember I said you could measure the parity with high fidelity and 99.8% Q and Dness. So we measure the parity to look for errors. If I use even cats and odd cats as my logical states, then photon loss would be a logical error. So here, if there's a photon loss, you get a minus sign both there and there. And so you, you haven't lost the information in the superposition, you just switch to a code that uses odd cats. We don't even correct that error. We just write down, oh, we just changed the code from even cats to odd cats. That's just another nice feature. You don't have to actually uh, correct the error. You just have to track the frame change, so to speak. So, um, uh, so this just like barely reached break even. There were certain errors were heralded because the uh, during the <clears throat> uh, parity measurement operations, um, the ancilla could end up that you could detect errors in the ancilla when you read it out, basically. And uh, so if you throw away the 20% of the time that that happened, then you were uh, well above break even. And uh, when you have a heralded error like that, that's called an erasure. And uh, you, it's an error at a known location. Those are much easier to fix. So if I had made up now a next layer code with many of these cat qubits, uh, those heralded errors would be relatively easy to fix. Okay, uh, then the, uh, the next uh, code, uh, which is sort of uh, this binomial code, which I think you heard about uh, uh, from prior lectures, um, uh, Luyan Sun, who used to be a postdoc uh, with Rob Sholkoff, is now has his own group in Tsinghua. Uh, they did a previous experiment uh, that came close to break even. Now they have a new one that is uh, slightly above break even. So, uh, and by the way, what's the analog of the overhead? You know, here in the short code, I told you if all of these had the same error rate, the you know you made the error rate nine times worse. What's the analog of that here? So I have my my uh, oscillator levels, and this is the 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 code you have to break, beat. Just those two guys, but the cat code, the binomial code, which has um, uh, on average two photons. Uh, in the mode and the cat code has on average some number that depends on the size of the cat. So when you, when you make it error correctable, you have to use more photon states and so it decays faster. That's the analog of the overhead that every error correcting code has. That this factor of nine for the short code, it's some factor of, uh, so here on average you have half a photon and in this code, on average, you have two photons. So the overhead is four. What's the kitty color? This is the, this is the, uh, this is the, so that this is the, there's a whole family of binomial codes. This is the smallest one and it's the kitten code. Yeah. It's the smallest. It, 
if you look at these things actually, and you make the Wigner function plots, they look a kind of uh, uh, like the cat code in a way, but it has a bounded, there's an upper bound on the max, on the photon occupations. This is somehow better than um, well, that, it's different. Uh, it ha we sort of we invented it because we wanted to have uh, zero amplitude above some specified photon number, and we also wanted to have a family of codes that correct could correct different numbers of photon losses and different numbers of dephasing events. Uh, and also, I needed a summer project for a visiting undergrad, <laughs> and somehow we got lucky. So, no, no, no. This is with active error correction. You're measuring the parity, measuring the parity, and hoping that the parity jumps are not too close together. Because if you got two in between your measurements, you would you would miss it. No, no, then, then you, based on the parity change, you're doing, uh, okay, so what, what is the thing we're doing here? Oh, suppose I detect that I've lost a photon. So if I lose a photon from this state, I get that state, right? If I lose a photon from this state, I get that state. Notice they both have the same coefficient, root two. Why is that? Because they have the same average photon number. So that's why. Okay. And so, uh, so I've ended up now, uh, I was in alpha, zero logical plus beta one logical. And now I'm in um, alpha uh, a three plus beta one. And what happened to the root two? Well, ha you have to normalize the state so it goes away. But it's very, very important that they both had the root two, otherwise, the coefficients alpha and beta would be distorted. Okay. So now I, I, the parity has changed. I must do something and I must do something very strange. I must take a state. If it has um, three photons, I have to do a superposition of adding one and subtracting three. And you can do that because it's quantum mechanics, <laughs> okay? There's some crazy pulse sequence where you drive the cavity and drive the transmon and you uh, wiggle phases and amplitudes around but, and it's figured out numerically and it does that. This one is simpler. If you see one, you just have to uh, go to two. How long does it take that? This is a unitary correct error. Right, right. right. So it takes, um, you know, a microsecond-ish. So, but uh, as Matthew pointed out, photon loss is not a unitary event, right? It's a, it's a collapse. And yet I was able to correct the error with a unitary. How can that possibly be? And this is, this is the key thing about error correction. You choose the unitary conditioned on the measurement result of the syndromes. And so effectively, it's not unitary when you average over the results. I find that very interesting. Yeah. So, you know, even if you, you know, the whole idea is, as you emphasize, that you're not measuring the, or an error is not measuring the logical piece, it's just measuring the local. Right. So these notice that both code words are eigenstates of parity. That and the parity is the stabilizer. That's, that's, that violation of the syndrome. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, right. so if I measure the parity, I don't learn anything about alpha and beta. I only learn whether there was a photon loss or not. 
Well, so that's that was my question. I guess okay. So maybe you answered it. Like so, you there's it's not that you learn more more generally. If you measure like a qubit uh, in Tori code, something local, you learn a little bit. Don't you learn a little bit? Like more generically, you learn something about the logical qubit, but not. No, you learn nothing about it. So you, you really have to have a nothing, or can you learn like a like a weak measurement where you learn a little bit? Well, if that happens, then then you're going to worsen the logical lifetime. You're going to screw it up. I see. So you really want to design it so you learn. Right. Really commute with the. Absolutely, and in the Toric code the logical operator is a string of Z's or X's wrapping around the torus, whereas the local uh, plaquette measurements commute with that. Even, even the Z, string of Z's, commutes with X, 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 X around the plaquette. Yeah. Yep. Good, good questions. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, yes. You you you're using the transmon to measure the parity. Um, well, uh, you you have to use one of those instruction sets, snaps or uh, control displacements. You can do it with either one. Uh, you can also just. Uh, run a grape algorithm and figure out some crazy control pulse that will do it in a way that you don't understand. <laughs> so you have three choices. Uh, yep. The measurement only tells you, you, you only measure the parity. Um, so how do you know the, which recovery operation? Oh, you have to do them both. Again, you have to do a crazy thing where you, if it's one, add one photon. If it's three, add one and subtract three. And you have to do them both, and you have to not you have to not know which one you did. <laughs> right? If you knew which one you did, uh, then you would know whether you were in that uh, which logical state you're in. So, okay, if. If you're not convinced that quantum mechanics is weird yet, you know. <laughs> Other questions? Yep. Yeah. Is this algorithm like with a bunch of different pulses that you do? And you're like, okay, I want the one that I feel like the fastest. Or... Yeah, you, you, um, it's tricky. So, you know, if you allow yourself infinitely strong pulses, maybe you can do it really fast, but the thing blows up, right? So, so you, you know, or little tiny, those one hertz terms in the Hamiltonian will kill you that you, you we left off. Uh, so you want to optimize for speed uh, with some energy constraint or so, some kind of, you know, real you know experimental constraints that you you just can't do certain things with your control system like yeah yeah but but the those instruction sets i was telling you about snap and control displacements they were they also can be done numerically but they have the advantage that you can if you look at the commutator algebra so you can kind of figure out analytically how to do them by hand, but maybe not. But the numeric, numerical optimized version of those is usually better. Yeah, good. So if, when people talk about error thresholds, is the source code, you make the source code bigger and bigger, or they talk about concatenation? Yeah. What, have you, you extend this to no direction? Yeah, so that'll be the end of the talk. And I just want to emphasize that Error correction gain and being below threshold are not the same thing. Okay. So you could have error correction gain at this size torrent code, and you think, oh boy, I'm below threshold, and uh, I'll just make it bigger. And it might get better for a little while and then start getting worse. You're actually below threshold. So, uh, and that's the sort of what happened in the Google experiment. Uh, so it, they're separate concepts.
Okay. All right. So that was like background for the code I want to talk to you about, uh, which is the uh, GKP code, which I think you also heard about from, uh, at least from Liang. And uh, the, the, you know, the paper, well, I usually say, you know, it was written by theorists. Uh, and they had no idea that this state would be impossible to make experimentally. Uh, I've told John this, he doesn't understand why it's true, but it, it's hard to imagine that there are now experiments that actually make this crazy state. Uh, but it took, uh, it took 20 years almost. So, uh, and these are, these are codes that rather than, they're not very well thought of in this FOC basis, they're better thought of in the phase space pictures that I've been showing you, okay? And so as you've heard, if you think about the ideal GKP state, it's wave function, psi of Q or psi of X is a series of very, very sharp peaks that go on forever. So this has infinite energy, these guys are infinitely squeezed and there's no position uncertainty there. Uh, it's not physical. So the experiment will not be done with this, but with some approximation to this. And um, the, uh, that's logical zero and logical one is the same thing displaced by half a lattice constant, okay? And what are the state, what are, these are both plus one eigenstates of a couple of stabilizers. And those stabilizers are things I've talked to you about before, uh, momentum boost by two root pi or position displacement by two root pi. See, that's the lattice constant. So this guy, if I displace that by a lattice constant, I get the same state back. So it's a plus one eigenstate of that. If I do a momentum boost, um, uh, this guy comes back to the, uh, they, they both come back um, uh, to the same thing. It turns out, that's le less easy to see. Um, but, um, and, then, and then the code was designed by my theorist friends to correct an error, which is not very, physical, it's just the small displacements. The real errors are amplitude damping. But it turns out, you know, that uh, we were later able to show that it's uh, also very, very, more or less the optimal code for amplitude damping, and probably Liang talked about that. But let's just pretend that, uh, and in principle, super linear combinations of different displacements can represent uh, whatever you want in principle. But let's just think about a small displacement. Suppose the lattice drifts to the right a little bit, and then you, this thing, each Q, uh, if Q were on the lattice, then this will be e to the i some multiple of two pi. But if it's slightly off the lattice, I'll get a phase, okay? And this stabilizer, unlike qubit, Pali strings, it's not just plus one or minus one. It's a, a unitary whose eigenvalues live on the unit circle. It has a continuous eigenvalue spectrum. Well, you need that because you have an infinitely big Hilbert space. And if it were qubits, you know, you would need infinitely many stabilizers to get you down, infinity minus one stabilizers to get you down to the code space. Here, you only need two stabilizers, but they have a continuous spectrum. So that's how you get rid of an infinite number of states. Okay. So the error correction would be, oh, I, I do phase estimation and I discover there's been a small shift to the left, so I'll shift it back. Or I'll change my frame, it doesn't matter. Okay. And conversely, if there's a small momentum shift, the other guy uh, tells you that. Okay, so this is uh, why you only need two stabilizers. All right, so um, if I could uh, measure uh, the imaginary part of this stabilizer, 
uh, it would tell me um, uh, the small position shift that I see. Yeah, the phase the phase starts to shift on those guys. Exactly. Yeah, and they're still in the same place, but the phases instead of all being plus one, they slowly shift. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's easier to visualize position shifts than momentum shifts, but that's the idea. Okay. Well, okay. So these states have infinite energy. So in reality, the experimentalists insist on not doing that. And maybe you can make a state which has kind of got an envelope, e to the minus epsilon n hat, the oh. number operator acting on, on your ideal state. Uh, why that? Well, why is that a, a Gaussian envelope? Well, because n hat for an oscillator is x squared plus p squared. So, you know, it looks like a Gaussian in phase space. And when you put that envelope on, the heights of these peaks go down. And also they develop a little width. They're not infinitely squeezed. Okay. So we have to work with these realistic states and the, pri the theoretical progress that we made to contribute to the success of the experiment was figuring out how to do gate operations and, and um, stabilizer measurements in a more accurate way, given that you know it's supposed to be a Gaussian envelope. Just automatically. Uh, yeah, the way that the gates uh, uh, that we use to create the state uh, make it happen automatically, basically. Plus, you you measure these stabilizers appropriate for approximate stabilizers for this Gaussian thing, and you you make it happen by uh, just con continual measurement. I'll, I'll, we'll get into that. All right. I mean, it looks like they're fixed. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, right. So, uh, right. So that's what we're going to talk about now. I showed you pictures of vacuum and squeezed vacuum, and I showed you uh, uh, control sequences that would produce squeezing. And uh, when you squeeze something in this direction, it squirts out in that direction because phase space is incompressible. It's basically Liouville's theorem that all Hamiltonian flows are divergenceless in phase space. And um, uh, so if you squeeze the wave function in position, the momentum wave function gets broader. Okay, so uh, what we seem to have, however, in this state is uh, something which is highly squeezed in position, although you don't know which lattice site you're on, okay? And if you uh, pretend that this is a crystal and do Bragg diffraction off it, you discover that the momentum is highly squeezed and only occurs at Bragg peaks. Uh, and so uh, it turns out that if you think about how to represent the state, like with a Wigner function or a characteristic function in phase space, you see that every one of these dots is squeezed in both position and momentum at the same time, apparently violating the Heisenberg principle. But you're saved by the fact that you don't know, like actually the momentum is uncertain because it could be here, or here, or here, or here, or here. And position is uncertain because it could be there, 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 or there. And yet each point is squeezed in both directions below the vacuum limit. Okay. And uh well no <laughs> i don't think so i don't think that's a good analogy uh so uh so everything becomes clearer when you think about the fact that the displacements that i've talked to you about in position and momentum boost they don't commute with each other because when you go around a loop in phase space, you pick up a Berry phase. The Berry curvature that Emmanuel talked about is constant in phase space, unlike the uh, graphene band structure where it's concentrated near the degeneracy. It's a constant in phase space. And it's uh, 
uh, two pi per unit of action. The area in phase space has units of action. So um, uh, where the unit is Planck's constant. Okay. So uh, if you choose the lattice constant very precisely so that um, uh, these two, the, these two, if the area uh, in these units is four pi, then these will commute. And I say four pi rather than two pi because there's one state in phase space per two pi. And I wanna get two states for my qubit. Okay. So we have two stabilizers and they are translations in phase space. If I translate from here to here, or from here to here to here, if I translate by a lattice constant in either direction, I get the same state because the states are plus one eigenstates of these translation operators. Okay. Is that a way to also, like if you start with a state, like a single block, like just yeah. you keep applying this? Yeah. You generate it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you have to you have to measure the eigenvalue. You have to do phase estimation to make sure you're getting the right eigenvalue. If it ends up with a certain phase, then you got to slide the whole lattice over. But that's just a simple translation at the end. Okay. So now logical operators, as I'm sure you heard from Liang, uh, uh, are also translations, but only by half as bit much as the uh, stabilizer. So if you were to translate twice, that's x squared is a stabilizer, but that's one. But that's exactly what you want for pali x. x squared should be the identity. Likewise, z squared, which is half of that stabilizer displacement, if you do it twice, you should get plus one, which is also what pali operators are supposed to do. If I uh, translate by x uh, and then by z and then x dagger and then z dagger, uh, I enclose area one fourth of four pi, it's pi, I get a minus sign. Well, that's good because X and Z are supposed to anti-commute. Likewise, X times Z is supposed to be I Y, and the I comes from the fact that, that enclosed area is pi over two. So if I compactify phase space onto a torus with area four pi, I, uh, the Weyl-Heisenberg translation algebra turns into the Pauli algebra. Okay, all right. So both stabilizers and Pauli and Clifford operations uh, on one and two qubits, there are translations in phase space. So how do I measure the eigenvalue of a translation to see what what the stabilizer value is or to see what the uh, logical Z operator is. How do I measure the eigenvalue of a translation? Well, we have to do this phase kickback trick that I showed you before. You build a Ramsey interferometer where you put the, the qubit into the X state by rotating by pi over two around the Y axis. You do a conditional displacement the control displacement that I talked about last time so that you can get interference between doing the displacement and not doing the displacement in order to see the eigenvalue. You get this phase kickback, which you then measure. Okay. So this is, a, you, you know about uh, the phase estimation algorithm where you apply different powers of the unitary and figure out from the phase kickback what eigenvalue you have. Uh, this circuit gives the first bit in that uh, measurement. That's the same, that's the control displacement gate. This is the control displacement gate controlled by sigma z of the qubit. Yep. So uh, you only get one bit of information. The actual eigenvalue is a real number. So you have to repeat it many times to uh, if you want to estimate it and uh, feedback very slowly on that because most of what you're measuring is just shot noise. There's a little, if you get zero slightly more often than one, I mean, plus one slightly more often than minus one, 
uh, eventually after many measurements, you notice that the translation is positive rather than negative. Okay, so I showed you last time how to calibrate the size of those control displacements and um, also how to measure Wigner functions using a characteristic function with, um, which is the same thing as measuring a stabilizer with this phase kickback. It's exactly the same thing. And you get these beautiful pictures. This is data of uh, logical Z, logical Y, and logical minus X uh, in the GKP code, okay? And um, this is such a complicated state. I mean, it's just hard to imagine that you could build it, but it's now possible. And uh, so this is from the, the latest result from the Devere group. And uh, so how do you, we turn on some stabilization scheme. It's, it's, um, it's quasi-autonomous. Uh, it involves uh, doing um, uh, uh, several control displacements and qubit rotations to, to um, determine one stabilizer and then the other stabilizer. But rather than like measuring and feeding back, this is done uh, essentially autonomously, uh, not, not quite, but almost. And you basically um, uh, measure and just, you just reset the qubit at the end, okay? So um, this involved uh, some, uh, some theory developments that we did and uh, uh, learning how to do these control displacements. Uh, very high-speed real-time processing that, that was invented for the CAT code experiment, and then uh, some uh, machine learning algorithms applied to tune up the experiment. And uh, basically, at the end of each of these cycles, you have two measurement results, G, G or GE or EG or EE. There are four possible results. And the net effect of this cycle is a rank four um, uh, Krauss channel. And it spontaneously stabilizes you into the code space, not to a particular state, but to the code space. And uh, so you turn it on and eventually you fall into the code space. Then you make a logical measurement to determine where you are in the code space. And um, to really get the final thing that got the experiment above break even was this reinforcement learning agent running on GPUs that turned uh, about 45 knobs in the experiment and kept checking whether the error correction gain got better or worse. <laughs> and after four hours, uh, the agent had uh, had done some interesting things, like it slowed down the readout and made it last longer, because apparently when you went fast, it was doing something bad. Um, and uh, it, it gave us the extra improvement to get the experiment finally to get well above break even. So here is the uh, Wigner tomography of the error correction process happening, okay? So you prepare zero logical and you turn on the error correction protocol. And after 100 cycles of error correction, a number which is way beyond anything people have done with qubits, you can still see the state looks pretty good. After 200, after 400 is starting to look a little bad. And after 800, you can see that, uh, you, you, the blues and reds, which are the signs of the uh, Wigner function, are, they're all red. So basically, you, you, it's become a classical mixture now at this point, but af only after 800 cycles. Here's one logical, and eventually it starts to look like this, right? So you've, lo you've lost the information. Here are some cuts of the, the marginal distributions in, this is like the square of the wave function. Uh, for the two, and you can see the sort of Gaussian peaks with finite squeezing and a Gaussian envelope, and uh, one state is displaced half a lattice constant from the other, 
And even after 400 cycles, they're still distinguishable, but after 800, they're basically the same, okay? So now you can calculate uh, the error correction gain. And so uh, here is the, um, uh, the, the transmon qubit uh, lifetime. This is the cavity zero and one lifetime encoding. That's the thing we have to beat, not this. And here is in the lifetime uh, in milliseconds when you use the GKP error correction. And the gain is about 2.3. So it's well above one, but it's a lot less than 10 to the 15. Okay. So, uh, so here's like a compendium of various bosonic codes, uh, one, two, three, that are, have gain above one. Here's lots of uh, bosonic codes and qubit codes that are all getting worse when you do the error correction. And uh, um, uh, the, uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, our friendly competitor uh, uh, at ETH, uh, Jonathan Holm, who has uh, also done experiments in this area, although it was difficult to get from their data an estimate of what the gain was. Uh, and I really want to emphasize that the error, the logical error probability per, not wall clock time, but per error correction cycle is, uh, is about uh, one, two, two and a half or three, uh, times 10 to the minus three. So you can go hundreds of cycles of correction and still have the data. And uh, that's just in a completely different place than uh, uh, other qubit experiments. Okay, so what's the outlook for this in the short term? Well, you can show that this uh, code and recovery procedure most of the errors are due to the, uh, the fact that we have to use a transmon. And uh, you can show that the recovery is, the thing is very robust against uh, phase flips in the transmon, not very robust against bit flips in the transmon. We put these in intentionally here and you see uh, the logical error rate doesn't go up much with intentional phase flips on the transmon, it goes up rapidly with intentional bit flips. So you could, uh, you could uh, change from a transmon to a Kerkat qubit or something else that has uh, um, rare bit flips and more phase flips and do better, biased noise. Uh, also, there's some weird stuff that happens uh, where the error correction gain will go fine for a couple of days and then boof, it collapses for a while. And then it comes back, you know, the qubit's just not feeling well that day, the transmon. And, you know, it's some two level system that moved around or got, I don't know, we don't know what it is, but uh, you do have these performance collapses every uh, few hours to few days, something we need to understand. Now, so now to get to Matthew's question about if you now, so we made the error rate slightly lower. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, it's got, you know, it's not a stationary process. These two level systems come and go in some non-stationary statistics. Don't know, you know, I don't think, this is like typical, or, you know, it could go the other way. Just this is a particular set of data over one week. Yeah. Um, so uh, you, we've made a logical qubit that has error correction gain relative to, you know, the best physical part in it. But we haven't driven the uh, error correction rate down, you know, exponentially. How, what's the next step? Well, we want to make that error correction gain at this level, you know, 10 or 100 if we can. But then what you do is make a next level code 
you say, take all these GKP qubits, which now have very low error rates because they're already logical qubits, and concatenate that into another code like the surface code. And the nice thing is, is if you've gotten the bosonic code error probabilities way below the threshold for the surface code, you don't need to build a million qubit physical qubit surface code. You can build a pretty small one and gain exponentially in the size of the, the distance of the code, which is the, the length of one side of the square. Essentially. So the idea is to get way below the threshold for the next level of error correction that you build in. And then you can build a relatively small object with very, very good performance. Maybe, you know, it'll be a thousand, a gain of a thousand at that point without having huge numbers of moving parts. That's the, that's the fantasy. Okay, so uh, here's the team and uh, Vlad Sivak was the uh, experimental leader, uh, has, is now along with Alec Eichbusch. Uh, Vlad is now at Google. Uh, Baptiste Waye, my postdoc, developed this autonomous protocol uh, to um, this gate sequence to stabilize the states. And, uh, you know, lots and lots of people uh, contributed to this pretty, pretty massive uh, effort. So, uh, yeah, so I think I'll stop there and uh, thank you. Yeah, so in the non-autonomous version, you have to repeat this one-bit estimation of the real number many times and very weakly feedback. Like it takes you, you know, 50 measurements before you've got a pretty good idea. And so the, the, the feedback system should give a, a feedback that's like 1 50th of the measurement results so that you slowly you don't overcorrect but so that was the old way of doing it with this new autonomous thing you're just you know resetting the qubit and you're getting this rank four channel which is a dissipator that just cools you into the code space i didn't have time to talk explain all the details but it's uh, uh, much better Yeah, and there are four outcomes. And so those produce four different uh, POVMs or Krauss maps. Yeah. That just does it. Yeah. <laughs> because measurements, right, produce um, irreversible behavior. And if you rig up the back action correctly, it's like cooling. Yeah. you reset the qubit. Yeah, and it turns out it's not completely autonomous because we use some information about the uh, measurement result to say, oh, there was some dispersive frequency shift of the cavity that went this way instead of that way. And we, we actually use that information to update future phases of control pulses. But it's if we didn't have that leftover dispersive coupling, it would be truly autonomous. Are there also yeah, so um, so we all, all the way we um, put information into the cavity for a bosonic code, we often start by putting it into the transmon as an alpha zero plus beta one and then map transmon zero to cavity logical zero and transmon one to cavity logical one. Uh, that's one way to do it. Uh, so that is transduction from the, uh, using various pulse sequences from the transmon to the cavity. Now, 
uh, as probably Liang talked about, GKP codes and other bosonic error correction codes are nice because if you put them in the optical uh, telecom wavelengths, you can send photons and lose some fraction of them and still uh, recover the state that was sent. But that requires transduction between 10 gigahertz and um, you know, a tenth of a petahertz or something. Uh, so that's a huge jump in frequency. And, uh, but there are lots of people working on exactly that. And there's been lots of progress, not huge bandwidth, but pretty high fidelity. So Conrad Lehnert here in uh, just in Jilla, just over here, uh, over there, <laughs> uh, uh, does such experiments. Um, uh, there are people at Yale, and they're all people around the world working on that uh, problem. And there are two figures of merit. There's the uh, conversion efficiency. Do I have a 90% chance of, if there's a photon at the microwave frequency, turning it into a photon at optical wavelengths? And then there's added noise. If uh, in the process of that conversion, I add extra photons, that's bad. And um, then the third figure of merit is the bandwidth. How fast, how, how wide a bandwidth signal can I do this? And that, um, that's a bit of a challenge to do that rapidly. Can be done at kilohertz rates, but not gigahertz rates. But that'll be important for, you know, entangling uh, objects in di uh, diff quantum computers in adjacent uh, refrigerators, for example. That's that'll be the first use locally, or even inside the same fridge, but you know, half a meter away or something. You might want to do it optically. Uh, uh, and then, you know, for other quantum communication purposes, you want to go with telecom wavelengths if you can. Okay. Okay, Steve, thank you for four.